I was speaking to a book group by phone in a suburb of Washington, D.C. And they said that they had decided that their book group would have a night out and that they would go to a Moroccan restaurant because they were reading The Red Tent and that was their meeting that night, a little sort of holiday. And they got to the restaurant, it was a Monday night, so there were hardly any tables, hardly anyone there, but there were three other tables with groups of women reading their book group, doing the red tent at the Moroccan restaurant. <laughs> this probably doesn't a, surprise you. A lot you. of hummus has been eaten in, <laughs> in, honor, in honor of the red tent, even though those ladies did not eat hummus. And, but, but there's this, um, yeah, there's a, there's a desire to, to eat. I think they would probably just be eating um, a lot of uh, olives and dates if you were really going to be accurate and, and goat. But not too many want, yeah. people want to go. Now, I have to ask you about what gave you the literary courage to write a popular novel based on biblical characters? Well, I, I didn't know what I was doing, so that was a really good thing. Because if I had known really what I was getting into, I wouldn't have had the nerve to do it. Because if you mess with the Bible, you're going to get in trouble. Um, so a few things. One of them was that uh, just before I started this, there was a television program. There was Bill Moyer's Genesis which was a conversation on PBS, which was quite popular at the time. And it had, um, it had rabbis and ministers and priests and an imam uh, talking about the stories of Genesis. Uh, and it was, it was wonderful. And it was a book. And I watched it. And I thought it was terrific. So, so it was sort of part of the conversation. Um, and I, I was sort of toying with the idea of trying a novel and trying to do this. And then I went, um, I read the reviews of Angels in America by Tony Kushner. And, um, said to my husband, I have to see the original cast of this. And I had never done this in my life. And we drove to, it was the first, my daughter was five or six, and we for the first time left her for the weekend ever, and drove to New York and saw one play, and then the next day we saw the second part of the cycle. And it was gorgeous. It took, my, it took the top of my head off. It was really amazing theater. I'm, and I go back to the theater looking for that all the time and very rarely find it. But I remember sitting next to this guy who I had a conversation with because I think I ran into him at the Empire State Building. I, and, and, and then, I, then I'm, and we, we were lying next to each other and we chatted and then we're sitting all of a sudden in Angels in America together. This big gay guy from the Midwest, from Kansas City with his boyfriend. And he is sobbing while, the, while up on the stage someone is reciting the, the Kaddish. And you know, I, I just thought in the car on the way back, if Tony Kushner can do that, then I can write a biblical novel. I, it for some reason gave me, it inspired me that he had so much courage to put that on, on the main stage of a Broadway, you know, Broadway theater for a mixed audience of everybody in the universe, and it was so powerful. So that, I don't know, it, it opened, it unlocked some fear. It, it, let, me, it let me try something. Yeah. And I know there's um, many writers in the audience who we all want to hear about the tipping point when the red tent just you know sort of took off and we heard this sort of urban legend that you or somebody sent copies of the red tent to reform rabbis or reconstructionist rabbis and then i read online that this is really true that picador was that it was being well would you tell the uh, story yeah well the red tent was published to absolutely silence there were no reviews um, almost no reviews. There were a couple of really nice ones from Baptist ministers in Alabama and Texas. Really, I mean, those were my best reviews. They were until it until it sort of picked up some steam. And um, but it was you know deafening silence. My editor left the um, publishing house. Um, it almost didn't make it into paperback. But they were going to pulp the hardcovers. It sold I don't know twenty thousand copies, which isn't bad for a first novel actually. But it wasn't you know. But it wasn't uh, that was after a long time. But it was less than that. Actually, it was less than um, probably probably less than that. Anyway, but they were, they were leftovers and they weren't selling, so they were going to destroy them because it's cheaper to destroy them than to leave them in the warehouse. And I, had, and I knew this story from something else, that, um, that, um, that my rabbi in, at the time had gotten a book from some writer saying, dear rabbi, please would you consider reading this and if you like it, maybe you'll talk about it and recommend it to other people. So I had to heard that from someone else. And I happened to have a lot of rabbi friends. And at the time, two of them, one of them was the president of the Women of Reform, the Reform Rabbi Women Organization, and the other was the president of the Reconstructionist Rabbis, all of them. And those lists are not enormous. 
Picador um, said, okay, we'll, we'll pay for the postage if you, if you get the lists. They didn't give them the lists, but the, you know, um, and the, my rabbi friends wrote letters saying, it's a good book, you'll like it. But that's not what made it a bestseller. What made it a bestseller was book groups and independent bookstores. That's really what made it a bestseller. That's, that's what did it. I think that helped. There was a review in Reform Judaism magazine, that, you know, sometime after it came out in paperback. But it was independent bookstores. It was book groups, book groups, book groups. I went to every book group that invited me, when it, especially when it was in paperback locally. And I went to a lot. And, uh, and then it's word of mouth. It's, and book groups are this amazing engine. And publishers try very hard to buy them and say, you know, if you like this one, you like that one. They put reading guides in the back. But it's, you can't buy book groups. It's, it's, is it a good conversation? Do people get, have enough to say about it? Do they get worked up about it? Is there an argument? Is there a, you know, are hearts moved? Do people cry? I, I, that's what I think makes a book group bestseller. So that's how it happened. <laughs> There's I no think, magic I, bullet. I know. I think all we authors are thinking, I have remaindered books. And who would my target audience be if I could get a mailing list? Find, out? find a base. Go to your base. My Let's base. You know. OK. OK. And I wanted to ask you more about you than about the books. You said in a speech, you're a product of a mixed marriage. Your father was an optimist, and your mother a committed pessimist. Can you give us a little sort of paragraph bio of each parent? I know there's some Jewish history. Oh, there's a lot I mean, of yeah, serious. Uh, my parents are Holocaust survivors. They survived the war in Europe. They were not in concentration camps. They were interned, ultimately, both of them in Switzerland, which is where they met right after the war. They were let out of camps, and they met in Switzerland and uh, moved to the United States in 1948. Um, and uh, my father, who who is has been dead for 15 years, was a great reader and a great optimist and, uh, and a lover of words and dogs and foolishness and, um, uh, and, and in Yiddish, a luftmensch, which is a sort of a, 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 an air person, somebody who lives in his head and, um, and was a very gentle human being. My mother is a very um, fierce kind of person and um, ambitious in her own way and very hardworking. And um, you know, in a different world, she would have been, I don't know, the CEO of a large company, or um, she could have done any number of things. She's got tremendous intelligence. Um, but, um, but certainly, the glass is half empty for her, and it was certainly half full for my father. The, my mother is still very much alive and well, lives in Newton. Um, and um, if she were here, I wouldn't be saying this. <laughs> and, and what countries, what countries were they, <laughs> right? <laughs> What countries? What countries were they from? Uh, my father was born in Germany, and his family moved to Italy when he was a boy. So um, his his father realized they should get out of Germany, and his immediate family, his entire immediate family, nuclear family, survived the war. He lost cousins, and his extended family was wiped out. My mother was born in Poland, and her family moved to Paris when she was two, and um, a lot of her family was wiped out. She, uh, her brother uh, died in Auschwitz. Her father disappeared. But she survived the war with my grandmother, and my mother really rescued her in life. Because she was very strong and determined and a survivor, got her and, and my grandmother out of Vancy, which was the transit camp outside of Paris, and got them to, uh, to eastern France, to the border of Switzerland and across. So, um, but I think it's a temperament thing. I think you're born an optimist or a pessimist, actually. And what languages were spoken? What languages were spoken in your house as you were growing, growing up? up? Um, Yiddish, French, Italian, a little, a little German. Yeah. And you speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I, very French, well. French, very French, well. French is my second. You know, my my Lucky. not not fluent, my conversant. But I have a good accent. 